guys may be seated this morning. Worship team, you may be dismissed. Well, I want to say welcome to Mighty Wind Worship Center this morning. So glad you guys are here. Welcome to everyone that is watching on live stream. So glad you are joining us this morning. So glad you are here. I know some of you that are not here, you're preparing for your Super Bowl, Super Bowl event this evening. But what you don't realize is that you are missing the Super Bowl this morning. You are missing that excitement and that opportunity here with God this morning. Because all I know is, is that if it had not been for the Lord on my side, I didn't say I got it right all the time. I didn't say I got it right last week. I didn't say I'm perfect, uh, but if it had not been for the Lord on my side, I can't tell you where I would be. And I'm so grateful this morning for his grace and his mercy that's new every morning. Because I don't know about you, but I tap into it every morning. Because I need it every morning. And I thank you guys for being here. Uh, I believe the Lord has a good word for you this morning. I don't know about you, but I, over the years I've watched commercials, and this is not just because of Super Bowl Sunday and all the new commercials are coming out, but over the years I've watched commercials and there, there have been some pretty interesting commercial phrases that we've heard over the years. And two of them today just kind of stuck out for me. Um that's going to introduce the message for you this morning. And I, this one might, well actually both of these probably go back a ways. So I don't know how many, I don't know if you're under 40 if you're gonna remember these. But the first one I would say is this, the first one is, I used to see that commercial, everybody remember the Wolf Brand Chili commercial? And it used to say this, how long has it been since you've had a bowl of Wolf Brand Chili? How long has it been? As if to insinuate it's been so long that you've forgotten how good it is. And then another one was the Kellogg's commercial, the Corn Flakes. Not that generic bag that you see in H-E-B that most of us buy. But I'm talking about the box with the bird on it. Okay. Rooster, bird, it's got wings, it's fine. But the commercial used to say this. It used to say, taste them again for the first time. As if to insinuate every time you eat cornflakes, you're tasting them as if it's the first time. See, these two commercials connected me to the message this morning because I believe in our relationship with God and our relationship with Jesus Christ. See, I believe that there are times that we have lost our, our pleasure in our relationship with Christ. There have been times to where we have lost the delight that we had in our relationship with Christ. 
See, there have been times that we have lost the joy of our salvation in our relationship with Jesus Christ. See, there have been moments to where we have lost the luster, we have lost the connection, we have lost the relationship. The flame has fanned out in our relationship with Jesus Christ. See, I wonder, has your relationship with Christ lost its luster this morning? See, I wonder if your relationship with Christ has lost its delight this morning. I wonder if you have lost the joy of your salvation. See, I wonder if Christ has lost his place in your heart this morning. See, I wonder, I wonder if we put something else where Christ used to be. See, the Bible says this. It says in Psalms 34, 8, it says, taste and see that the Lord is good. It says, taste and see that the Lord is good. And it's not just for those who don't know Christ. It's not just for those who don't know the Lord. Even for those who know the Lord. See, you and I, even though we know him, we still have to taste and see that the Lord is good. No matter what season of life you're in, no matter where you are in your relationship with Christ, you still have to taste and see that the Lord is good. He didn't say, see that scripture doesn't mean taste one time and that's it. See, because I don't know about you, but whatever my favorite food is, and as you can tell, it looks like I have a few. Even though I am a solid 150. <laughs> Somebody held up two fingers. And I'm assuming that that meant that I'm a solid 152. See, but when I, when I have a favorite food, I don't taste it one time and never eat it again. See, I eat it, and 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 then what I do is I tell somebody else how good it is, and then I invite them to eat it, and I invite them to eat it again with me, and then I eat it some more, and I eat it some more, but I don't just do it one time. See, I keep tasting, and I keep seeing that the Lord is good. See, sometimes we allow life to suck that out of us. We allow the daily struggles of life. How many have daily struggles in life? See, over the years in our relationship with Christ, we have allowed those daily struggles of life to drain us of the joy of our salvation, to drain us of the luster that we had in our relationship with Jesus Christ. See, but today, God sent me here to ask you, have you lost your first love? Have you lost your first love? Have you lost that time? See, because life is hard sometimes, and it does suck that out of us. Some of you might be in a place to where you've lost your first love and you don't know how to get it back. Some of you may think the solution this morning is just stop coming to church altogether. Or I've heard people say, I just need to go try another church because 
I don't feel Jesus anymore. It's not the church. It's you and me. We've lost the luster in our relationship with Christ. He's lost that place that he once had in our life. And we're trying to figure out how to find it again. We're going to go to Revelations today. We're going to go to Revelations today. And we're going to talk about the church of Ephesus. And the church had lost their first love. But the city of Ephesus was a, it was a prime time location. It was where everybody wanted to be. It was kind of like New York City, so to speak. It was right by the ports. It was a city where all the action was happening. But it was also a city that was filled with idols. They literally had statues of idols. And Paul had gone through that place and he had started preaching the gospel and the city was in turmoil. People's money, their jobs and careers were being lost because Paul was preaching the gospel and nobody wanted to put up idols anymore. Silversmiths were losing money. And the church was growing. And in Revelation chapter 2, starting in verse 1, It says this, this is a letter that's written to the church in Ephesus. And verse 1 says, to the angel of the church in Ephesus, write. In other words, that angel, the word angel means messenger. They're talking to the pastor. Have you ever been to a church and they say, we want to give honor to the angel of the house? Oh, that's only in black churches. <laughs> my bad, my bad. That's only in black churches. They say, we want to give honor and glory to the angel of the house. See, but what that scripture is saying, this was written to the pastor and the message said, hey, pastor, I need you to share this word with the church. I need you to let them know how important this word is that's coming forth. It's significant. They need to hear it. They've got to hear what's being said. And then it says to the angel of the church in Ephesus, right? The words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands. Somebody said, that's why I don't read Revelations. <laughs> See, but God is sharing the seven stars in that scripture he's talking about the pastors of these churches and he's saying I'm holding the pastors in my right hand so any pastors in here I need you to know God's got you baby he's holding you in your right hand in his right hand any pastors that are watching this morning I need you to be reassured that God is holding you in his right hand. And the significance about his right hand is this. Scripture tells us that his right hand is his hand of power and authority. And he said he's holding you in his right hand. That's why it's so significant for pastors to truly 
be above reproach because God is holding you up in his right hand. But then he says, the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands. The seven golden lampstands are the churches. It's the church. And it says, he's talking about Jesus in that scripture. The words of him holds the seven stars. Jesus is holding the pastors. But it also says, he walks among the churches. I need you to know that Jesus walks among the churches. I need you to know that Jesus is walking among Mighty Wind Worship Center. He's in every row. He's in every seat. He's walking among the church. He's walking in the classrooms. When you're in the classroom, he's walking in, when you're doing ministry. He's walking among the churches. The question that I have for you is this. Is he devastated and broken or is he joyful by what he sees when he walks among us? He's walking among the churches. The question is, is he happy with what he sees? This is a personal question. How many of you know we are the, not this building, but we are the church? So if we are the church and he's walking among the church, that means he's walking with you. See, he's telling me as pastor to make this message personal to you. Because you are the church. Jesus is walking among you. Is he happy with you? See, you know the reason why I know we have lost our first love is by the way we treat people. By the way we treat people. See, I know we've lost our first love because we live in a society and it's evident in the church that we have lost respect for God and his people. Uh oh, we're going to get quiet this morning. Grant, will you come here for a second? Let me share with you what I mean. The Bible says this young man is made in God's image. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, it says, let us make them in our image. So that's God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost talking. And they're saying, let us make them in our image. See, Grant is made in the image of God. See, it ought to be a problem for me to be able to lash out at Grant or to curse at Grant or to talk, talk about Grant behind his back or in front of him. It should be an issue for me to talk down about him, speak death into his life, to speak negatively about him and his family. It should be an issue for me to do that because when I talk to Grant, when I talk about Grant, I'm talking about God. Because Grant is made in the image of God. I'm not saying Grant is God. Nobody leaves here saying the pastor said Grant. <laughs> Grant is not God, but he's made in his image. See, I wonder if God is happy with the way that you treat people. I wonder if God is okay with you lashing out at Grant, knowing that when you do that, that's you treating God in the same way. If I asked you, would you treat God the same way you treat Grant? You would say no out of your mouth. 
But if you ever understand that he's made in God's image and that what you say to him, you're saying to God, then that means every interaction I have with Grant is me talking to God. Because this is God's creation. See, I should have an issue doing that to him. We don't. And, I, and you know what? He ain't even talking about the culture. He's talking about the church. The church doesn't have a problem with disrespecting God and disrespecting his people by the way that we treat each other. I wonder if God is happy with the way you treat people. Let me tell you. I wonder if God is happy with the way you talk to your husband or you talk to your wife or you talk to your boy, boss or you talk to your coworker, or you talk to your children or you talk to your friends. I wonder if God is okay with the way that you do business. I wonder if God was in the physical walking with you if you would talk to people the same way then that you do now. And if you tell me, no, it would be different, then that means, then that means that's wrong. And every day, you need to understand that God is walking with you. He said, I'm walking among the churches. You are the church. So he's walking with you. And the church has lost respect for the very people that God needs to save. He has, the church has lost respect for God's very creation. Somewhere along the line, we lost our first love and we became these sedity and bougie Christians who thinks we know everything and we don't know nothing. And if we want to see the power of the Holy Ghost feel this place and this land and this city and this state and this nation and this world is going to start with us returning to our first love and respecting God and his people. See, because when somebody from the church treats you in a manner that you don't like, the first thing you want to do is throw that in people's face. The first thing you want to do is run to the pastor and say, you would not believe how this person just treated me. Well, the question is, are you just reaping what you sown? That disrespect we have for God's people has to change. And the only way it's going to change is when we return to our first love. Have you lost your first love this morning? Verse 2 says this. Now God, now God begins to commend he begins to commend and he begins to give attaboys. In verse 2, and he says, I know your works. He said, that's great. I know what you have done. I know your works in a good way. He's talking to the church in a good way, the church of Ephesus. And he's saying, look, I know what you've done. I know your works. 
He said, you're doing, the works are good. He said, you're doing good things. You're doing good ministry. Mighty One Worship Center, you're doing good things. You're doing good ministry. You, you, you're doing everything you can to impact the community. You're serving. You're taking care of the babies that come in. You're taking care of the kids that come in. You're taking care of the, 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 the adults that come in. You, you, you're doing, I know your works. Then he says, I know your works and your toil. In other words, I know you're a worker. He said, I know you don't mind working. He said, I know you're willing to roll up your sleeves and get to work. He said, I know you're willing to clean if it needs to be clean. I know you're willing to serve if serving needs to happen. If this is not you, then you got to let this go in one ear and out the other. Or either you need to pick up a broom. Or you need to pick up a ministry. Or you need to pick up a kid and go serve him. But if it is you, he says, I know, you're a worker. You don't mind getting your hands dirty. He said, I commend you. Then he said, and your patient endurance. He said, you're an overcomer. He said, I commend you. He said, because when you could have ran, you didn't run. You overcame. You're more than a conqueror. You stay. When, when, when all else had been done, you stood. He said, I commend you for your patient endurance. And he said, and how you cannot bear with those who are evil. He said, I commend you for standing on truth. I commend you for, from, for fleeing from all appearance of evil. He said, I commend you for not blending your life with evil. He said, I saw the good works. I commend you. Then he said, I commend you because you tested those who call themselves apostles and are not and found them to be false. He said, I commend you for knowing your word. I commend you for standing on the word. I commend you for not being deceived. I commend you for holding people accountable to speak truth. I commend you for not sugarcoating anything. I commend you for when people are not speaking truth about me or my word that you don't get silent, you stand and you say something. I commend you. Now, if that's not you, then that means you got some work to do. But if it is you, then you're commended today. And then he said in verse 3, I know you are enduring patiently and, and, and bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary. In other words, he said, I know you have suffered for my sake. He said, I know you sacrificed for my sake. He said, I commend you because you suffered. I commend you because you sacrificed. I commend you because you sacrificed things and dreams and ambitions and goals and you did it for my sake. He said, I commend you. And he said, I commend you for suffering and remaining faithful. I commend you is what that word is saying to us today. But then verse 4 says this. But oh somebody say there's a but. He said but I have this against you that you have abandoned the love you had at first.
How many of you know you can look like a Christian? How many of you know we've been in church long enough to where we can look like and do the things that we know we're supposed to do to look like a Christian? See, in essence, that's what he's saying. He's saying, look, you're doing all the right things, but there's something missing. See, Jesus says in Scripture, he says, there are going to be people that say, Lord, Lord. And he's going to tell them, get thee away from me. I don't even know who you are. You look good in church. You look good going to service every week. You look good going to Sunday morning education every week. You look good. You said the right things. You did the right things. But something is missing. See, what God is sharing with you and I today is this. He said, you've given me your hands. And you've given me your head, your mind. He said, but I want your heart. He said, your hand and your head is not enough. He said, I want your heart. I want your heart this morning. And you know what was so crazy about that scripture is this. He said you've abandoned your, the love you had at first. He's not even saying that you don't love him. He's saying you just don't love him first. The problem is not that, see that's where we get mixed up. See, because we say, I do love the Lord. He said, I hear you, you love me. He said, but you don't love me first. He said, God is demanding love first. See, he's looking for you to love him first. Loving him is not enough. Loving him first is the expectation. We settle for just enough. But God is saying, hey, look, I need to be first. So what does loving God first look like? Listen to this. When you have to find time for God, but you have time for everything else, that lets me know you've lost your first love. Anytime you have to find time for God, when everything else under the sun comes up, you have time for that. But when God comes up, oh, I got to find time in my schedule. I don't know if I can do that. I ain't got no space. I ain't got no room. I ain't got time for that. I don't have, you don't have time for the person that gave you life? You got time for everything else under the sun. But now when God calls, I got to go find time. See, that lets me know that we've lost our first love. Listen to this. Anytime you reposition something else, listen, above God, it now becomes your idol. Anytime you reposition and you replace God as first, anytime you replace God as first, that thing becomes your idol. Let me break it down. Anytime you replace God with something else, that becomes your God. Uh-oh. See, if you put your kids before God, now your kids have become your God. And now you are running around town like a crazy person trying to make them happy when that was not the intent. If you put your spouse before God, she or he now becomes your God. See, God said this, there 
or no other gods before me. There are no other gods before me. I don't care what those gods are you're trying to make. There can be no other gods before him. God demands first place in your life. So whatever you put in first place, that becomes your God. Listen to, let me, let me show you how easy that would be. As pastor, the responsibility of this church is enormous. And it, would, it is very easy for me to allow the responsibilities to take precedence over my relationship with God. It would be very easy to allow you guys and this church to take precedence over God. But the moment I do that, this church becomes my God. And let me tell you, this church ain't going to save me. This church is not going to be my Lord. See, this church in this bit, you don't have the power to save me. You don't have the power to deliver me. The only person that has that power and ability is God Almighty. So if I ever get to a place to where I put this ministry and the responsibilities of this ministry above my relationship with God, this place now becomes my idol and my God. And I've lost my first love. Verse 5 says this. before I read it. So we know how easy it is to lose our first love. So now the question is, how do we get it back? How do we return to our first love? And it's going to be with the three R's. And we're going to hear that in the scripture. Verse 5 says this, Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, the first way you return to your first love is you got to remember therefore from where you have fallen. I need you to remember where you came from. I need you to remember what it was like when it was just you and God and you didn't have nothing. I want you to remember what it was like when you first came to the Lord and you didn't know any scriptures, you didn't know any verses, you didn't know how to pray. You didn't know anything. All you knew is that God had forgiven you of your sins and transformation had happened in your life. That's all you knew. You just knew something had been done. See, I need for you and I to remember the joy of our salvation. I need for you and I to remember where we were when God found us. See, sometimes we've been so far removed from where we were when God found us that we've forgotten what kind of a shape we were in and what kind of a mess we were in when God found us. But I need you to remember where you were when God found you. I need you to remember what God has done in your life. Some of y'all are sitting in here like God hasn't done anything for you. Some of us are sitting in this place, we come to this place every single week and we sit there with blank stares and blank faces like God hadn't done anything for us. I don't know about you, but I can't come in this place and just sit down and act like God hadn't done anything for me. All I know is that if it had not been for God, I wouldn't be breathing today. And I remind God every day, God, I thank you for what you've done for me. I thank you for what you set me free from. I thank you for what you've delivered me from. I thank you for the work that you continue to do in my life every day, over and over and over again. I can't come in here and just sit down and act like God hadn't done anything for me. So 
So you ought not be able to do that either. Every time we come into this place, there ought to be a celebration. Every time. I don't care what you're going through today. Every time that door is open, you ought to run. David said, <laughs> David said, let us be glad to go into the house of the Lord. See, David understood what it took for him to get to where he was. David understood the hell he had to go through to get to a place to where he was ready to celebrate God every opportunity he got. Every time we open those doors, you ought to, I ought to have to sit you down. You are so excited. Every time you come in that door, you have a reason to celebrate God Almighty. Are you breathing this morning? That's what you should have celebrated today doing worship. I'm breathing. I'm breathing. I'm standing. I'm sane today. My mind is working. My limbs are working. My body is functioning. I got a roof over my head. I may not have what I want, but I got it. There's food in my refrigerator. It may just be lunch meat, but I'm still getting to eat. I, I don't care what it is. You ought to be thanking God for everything that you have because if it had not been for him, you would have absolutely nothing. Don't come in here and act like you got it all together and you don't have nothing to thank God for, you ought to be running around this place because God has done so much for you. Shoot, I should have to be chasing you down and sit you down. See, I know we've lost our first love. I know we've lost our first love when we come into this place and we stand and worship and we look like this. I know we've lost our first love when we come into this place and we stand like this. I know we've lost our first love when we come in this place. Well, they ain't singing my song today. See, I know we've lost, because we think it's about us. It's not about you. It's about God. And I need somebody who wants to have church, who wants to thank God. See, that's the message that he's trying to send. It's time to return to our first love. But you got to remember what it was like when you were there. Remember. Remember when you cried yourself to sleep and nobody was there but Jesus. Remember when everybody was talking about you and nobody was there to comfort you but Jesus. Remember when people left you for dead. Remember who came and picked you up. Remember when people stabbed you in the back and nobody was there for you but Jesus. He came and he took the knives out of your back and he healed the wounds and he said, baby, let's move forward and let's go do what I've called you to do. Remember. Somebody say remember. But then he said, remember that for from where you have fallen. But then he said, repent. <laughs> Pastor, we talking about love. Why is that word repent in there? See, the only time in scripture that God uses repent is because he wants us to repent from sin. Everybody agree with that? So I need you to understand something. <laughs> we
Whenever you put something in front of God and it becomes your idol, it becomes your God. You become an idolater. And that's sin. Y'all too quiet. Anytime. You put something or someone in front of God. Now it's sin. See, but the church has candy coated it for too long. Let me tell you how we try to say it. Let me tell you how the church is trying to spend it. How, how the church is trying to spend it. Oh, it was just a bad decision. No, it wasn't a bad decision. It was sin. It was just a bad habit. No, it wasn't a bad habit. It was sin. That drug became more important than God. That alcohol became more important than God. Lust became more important than God. Pornography became more important than God. Pornography became your idol. The next time you need Jesus, go pray to pornography and see what happens. Because that's what you've done. You've put it in God's place. You want to know why you're not walking in victory? Because God's not in the right place. And the God you keep running to doesn't have the power to set you free and doesn't have the power to make you victorious and doesn't have the power to make you an overcomer and doesn't have the power to make you more than a conqueror. You keep running to the wrong thing. You keep running to sin and God is not going to bless your sin or your mess. We even try to say this. Well, I just need to get my priorities back in line. No, you're in sin. Do something about it. Put God back in his rightful place. Return to your first love. You want to see things change in your life? Return to your first love. Repent. Turn away from it. We're not making a 360 degree turn because you're still in the same place. You're making a 180 degree turn and you're walking away from it. And you're not even looking back. You're walking away from it. See, the Bible says the one who puts his hand to the plow, you can't look back. You can't look back. Too many of us are putting our hands to the plow and then we turn around and we look back and then we end up back where we started. That's not what God has called you to do. He says, put your hands to the plow and move forward. Leave what's behind you behind you. Repent. It's not a bad choice. It's idolatry. Call it what it is. It's sin. But then he said this, and do the works you did at first. So we got to remember, we got to repent, and we got to repeat. Do the works you did at first. See, when you first got saved and God found you, Lord, it was a new world. You was like that little toy where you pull the string out and that thing just goes. You ain't know how to do nothing, but you were willing to do everything. Nobody had to ask you for anything. You saw something wrong in the church, Pastor, I'll fix it. I don't even know what I'm doing, but I'll do it. I didn't have to come and ask for anything. Pastor Joe didn't have to come and ask for anything. When somebody 
is in love and God is in that first place of love, you don't have to ask them for anything. They see the need and they meet it. See, I need for us to begin to repeat those works that we did in the beginning. Nobody, you didn't have to find time to pray. You had time to pray. That was at the top of your list. You didn't have to find time to get in the Word. You got in the Word because that was what needed to be done. You didn't have to fight TV time and book time and personal time. You didn't have to fight any of that because he was your first love. He was more important to you than anything else on the face of the earth because he just set you free from something that you had been in bondage to for years. And he set you free and you had nothing but praise for him. Lord, let me do whatever it is I got to do. But now we've been so far removed. That we've forgotten what it's like. It's time for us to return to our first love. Listen to me. Worship team, you guys go ahead and come back. This is what I want to do this morning. I don't know who in this place has lost their first love. But you know what? If you have, I would be a horrible pastor if I left, if I let you leave today without the opportunity of returning to your first love. See, I want you guys to take this opportunity to remember what God has done for you. I want you to repent of all idols in your life. And I want you to repeat. Repeat. Pray. Be in the word. Be in service. Every time this door is open, you ought to be here. We used to couldn't get rid of you. Every time the door was open, you were here. We were trying to run you out because we wanted to go home. But you wanted to be here. Now I got to go send a search party out looking for you. This is what I'm going to do. I'm going to open up the altars. Pastor's not going to pray with you. Because this is personal. This is between you and God. This is between you and God. If you've lost your first love this morning, I've shared with you how, to, how you return. The question is, do you want to return? The question is, do you want to return? Do you even believe that you've lost your first love? See, I think that was the problem with the church in that scripture. They didn't even realize they had lost their first love. But I believe today the devil is a liar. The devil is a liar. The devil is a liar. I bind that up right now in Jesus' name. The spirit of distraction will not take precedence right now. You have no place. Nope. I bind that up in the name of Jesus Christ this morning. Spirit of distraction, you will not come into this place. This is an opportunity for you to come and make things right. This is an opportunity for you to come and say, God, I have removed you from first place. But I want you back. I want my first love. I want to return to my first love. I want the joy of my salvation restored. I want that luster back in my relationship with you. 
I want that excitement back in my relationship with you. This is not just for first time. This is for people that's been saved for 10, 15, 20 years. This is just time between you and God. This is an opportunity for you to return to your first love.
Father, this day, Lord, I thank you because you are great. I thank you because you are great today, Father. I thank you for each and every person, Father, that came forth today or even didn't come forth and understand that now is the time for them to return to their first love. Father, I pray that as they return to their first love, that you would meet them right where they are, Lord. Father, that you would restore to them the joy of their salvation, God. That that would be a restoration of the joy of their salvation this day, Father. And that that would be a burning fire on the inside of them, Lord. That's like fire shut up in their bones. That they would go forth and shout from the rooftops how good you are. That they would go forth and shout from the rooftops that you have transformed their life. That they are different and they're not the same. God, I pray that a newness, Father, would come forth and a willingness to surrender to you so that you can create them to be all that you called them to be, Lord. So I bless you this day, God. I bless you and I'm looking and excited for the report that's going to come forth. I'm excited to see what's going to happen as they go forth and return to their first love, Father. And I pray that the rest of this week, Father, that you remind them, that you would remind them when they have put other things in front of you and remind them that you are first, that there can be no other gods before you, and that they will surrender and make decisions. You told us it's decision-making time. So, Lord, I pray that each one of us are willing to make a decision to remove whatever we love first in front of you and, and put you first. Father, let us remember. Let us remember what you've done for us. Father, let us repent from putting other gods before you and let us repeat what needs to be done so that we can be in a right, reconciled relationship with you. Father, repeat. Being in your word, repeating prayer, repeating community, repeating all those things that we've been taught this day. In Jesus' mighty name, amen and amen. Give the Lord.